Tonight on Dispatches, how British policy is influenced by supporters of a foreign power. Something became skewed in British politics when an unelected uh, friend of the Prime Minister had so much influence. Dispatches reveals the activities of the most effective lobby working inside British political parties. The pro-Israeli lobby uh, in this country is the most powerful political lobby. There's nothing to touch them. We investigate the Israel lobby's bankrolling of British politicians. I don't believe, and I don't think anybody else would believe, that these contributions come with no strings attached. The Israeli invasion of Gaza earlier this year caused huge controversy. A few months later, the Conservative Friends of Israel held its annual lunch for Conservative politicians and businessmen. This year, the star speaker was David Cameron. I was astonished to note that he made no reference to the widespread killing of innocent civilians and massive destruction in Gaza six months earlier. Indeed, Cameron went out of his way to praise Israel because, so he said, it strives to protect innocent life. He said, if I become prime minister, Israel has a friend who will never turn his back on Israel. I resolved to ask questions. How does the pro-Israel lobby in Britain work? Who runs it? And how does it get results? What's clear is that support for Israel is a powerful presence in all the main parties. Look at this recent exchange in the House of Commons when David Amos, Secretary of the Conservative Friends of Israel, asked what the government was doing to improve British relations with Israel. Ivan Lewis, the Foreign Office Minister, who had been Deputy Chair of the Labour Friends of Israel, replied. Israel is a close ally of the UK and we have regular warm and productive exchanges at all levels. We shall continue to foster a close relationship with Israel. There's people who, who are very strongly supportive of Israel, yes. And you know, the Conservative Friends of Israel, the Labour Friends of Israel are all part of that. Mm. Yes, there is a pro-Israeli lobby and it's active in trying to define the debate in order to limit the options that British politicians can choose to options which would be acceptable to that lobby. So how does the lobby work? Money plays a big part. Millions of pounds in donations from businessmen and others into the bank accounts of politicians and political parties. The Conservative Friends of Israel is one of Westminster's most active lobbying groups. It claims, as its members, 80% of all Conservative members of Parliament. Watford, north of London. Inside this church hall, a Conservative Party candidate for the next election, Richard Harrington, is trying to win over the locals. Voters in Watford may not be aware that Richard Harrington is also chairman of the Conservative Friends of Israel. Individual CFI members have given him over £20,000 in the last year. And out of his own pocket, he's given 34000 to Conservatives. And that's not all. Mr Harrington is also director of the Number 10 Club, one of the Conservatives' big donor clubs, which in return for an annual membership donation of up to £50,000 to party funds, will arrange for you to have tea with David Cameron or meet William Hague. Aside from raising cash, some of the pro-Israel lobbies in Parliament also pay for and arrange trips to Israel. They have sent almost as many MPs and candidates on trips to Israel as have been made by all MPs to the United States and Europe combined over the last eight years. I've been on one of these trips, and to do justice to the Conservative Friends of Israel, I came under no pressure to write in their favour. But for some politicians, these can be trips with a difference. 
Two years ago, the CFI took 20 parliamentary candidates to Israel. When they got back, 10 of them received donations totaling £30,000 from CFI sponsors. Do you think there's a connection between the, on the whole, surprisingly soft line the Conservative Party takes towards the foreign policy of the Israeli state and the pattern of donors to the Conservative Party? Well, I think in the past there has been a, a, a connection between the people who gave money, but who we met and we talked to who were passionately concerned about Israel, and obviously we listened to their concerns. Mm -hmm. And in some ways we reflected them. But they don't like to talk about it, at least not in public. One Tory MP privately taunted me to make a film about the pro-Israeli lobby. He said, you don't have the guts of the biggest lobby in Westminster, and it's a big story. But when I went back to this courageous individual and say, hey, come on television and tell us about it, he ran a mile. One Tory front bencher was so paranoid that he insisted I didn't just turn off my mobile phone, but take out the battery in case we were being bugged. Here's how the lobby uses its influence at the highest level of British politics. Three years ago, Israel invaded Lebanon in retaliation for Hezbollah's attacks into northern Israel, during which two Israeli soldiers were killed and two kidnapped. During the Israeli invasion that followed, 1,000 Lebanese civilians were killed and an estimated $3.6 billion worth of the Lebanese economy was destroyed. William Hague had recently been appointed Conservative Shadow Foreign Secretary. Some 21,000 in donations were sent to him by CFI board members, including hedge fund billionaire Alan Howard and again Richard Harrington. I don't believe, and I don't think anybody else would believe, that these contributions come with no strings attached. On July 20th, Haig made a speech. In it, he called the Israeli response disproportionate. And I think we can say, in response to the question of my right honourable friend, that elements of the Israeli response are disproportionate, including attacks on Lebanese army units, the loss of civilian life and essential infrastructure, and such enormous damage to the capacity of the Lebanese government, does damage the Israeli cause in the long term. Moderate enough, you might think, but Lord Carms, a leading CFI donor who owns Dixon's and was treasurer of the Conservative Party, was outraged and threatened to withdraw funding to the party. Sir, William Hague's usual good sense has deserted him. Think again, William, for whom do you speak? Your comments are not merely unhelpful, they are downright dangerous. No further donations were received by William Hague from CFI board members. Well, I knew Stanley Carms when I was the chairman of the party, and he was one of those who took the view that any criticism of Israel is effectively damaging to the Israeli state. The Israeli lobbies appeared to want to censor British politicians from saying that elements of the Israeli reaction was disproportionate, and they appeared to be willing to uh, use uh, financial pressures as a way of uh, enforcing that decision. We've learned that after William Hague's speech, the director of the CFI, Stuart Pollack, had a meeting with David Cameron, at which it was understood that terms such as disproportionate are not the sort that Conservatives should use to describe Israeli military action. And then last June, at the CFI lunch, David Cameron didn't mention Gaza at all in his speech. He said, I look around and I see some of our biggest donors and a special thank you to you. He's going in front of, of a very large audience of very wealthy people, many of whom are going to give huge support to our party in the next election, which we need. So you don't go in and pull the tiger by the tail. For several months, we've been investigating the finances of the Conservative Friends of Israel. Here's what we found. First, let's look at income. In the Electoral Commission register, the Tory pro-Arab lobby 
reported income of £83,900 last year. So what did CFI report? Well, nothing. That's because it's an unincorporated association, which means it's just a collection of individuals who don't need to open their books. It may be legal, but it's hardly transparent. Next, how much in all does the CFI and its members hand out to the Conservative Party and candidates? Again, public information is sketchy. The Register of MPs' interests shows that CFI board members and their businesses gave the Conservatives over £2 million in the last eight years. But that's not the whole story. One Tory MP told me how after a chance meeting with Stuart Pollock, two cheques arrived through the post from businessmen closely connected to the CFI. He'd never met either of them before, and neither of them, so far as he knew, had even set foot in his constituency. We've also discovered that over £30,000 from CFI members went to campaign funds of members of Cameron's team, first elected in 2005. Ed Vesey, now Shadow Minister of Culture. Greg Hans, Shadow Treasury Minister. Michael Gove, Shadow Education Secretary. Grant Shapps, Shadow Minister of Housing, Brooks Newmark, Opposition Foreign Affairs Whip, and Shailesh Vara, Shadow Deputy Leader of the House. And what about David Cameron himself? We found out that in 2005 he met CFI supporter Pochul Zabludovic for coffee. Afterwards, he gave Cameron £15,000, followed by £50,000 to Conservative Central Office. Mr. Zabludovic says that he was an early contributor to David Cameron's leadership and all his contributions are a matter of public record. We've been reliably informed that donations from all CFI members and their businesses add up to well over £10 million over the last eight years. We believe that's more than any other lobby in Westminster. Here's another example of how the pro-Israel lobby works. A few weeks ago, the UN was to vote on a resolution following Judge Goldstone's report criticising both Hamas and Israeli forces for human rights abuses in Gaza. The CFI rang up William Hague's office and after consulting with David Cameron, he gave them this quote. Unless the draft resolution is redrafted to reflect the role that Hamas played in starting the conflict, we would recommend that the British government vote to reject the resolution. Good morning. Are you confident today? It was under Tony Blair that the Israel lobby first acquired real influence in government. Former chairman of the Labour Friends of Israel, John Mendelssohn, boasted... Zionism is pervasive in new Labour. It's automatic that Blair will come to Labour Friends of Israel meetings. Today, Mendelssohn is Labour's chief fundraiser and Labour Friends of Israel has sent even more MPs to Israel than has the CFI. Shortly before Blair became party leader in 1994, he met Michael Levy, the pop music millionaire, at a social event arranged by the Israeli embassy. They became friends, playing tennis together, and Levy became Blair's chief fundraiser. It's estimated that he raised over 15 million pounds for Labour before the row over cash for peerages. When Tony Blair became Prime Minister in 1997, he awarded Michael Levy a life peerage and made him his special envoy to the Middle East. But because Lord Levy was unpaid and working directly to the Prime Minister, what he negotiated between Israel and its Arab neighbours on behalf of Britain was kept secret. He didn't want to be a minister because had he been a minister, he would have been questioned on what he was doing. From the point of view of people like myself, a Shadow Foreign Secretary, I wasn't going to support what he was doing unless I knew what it was. Oxford University Middle East specialist Professor R.V. Schleim thinks Levy's role was actually damaging to Britain. Something became skewed in British politics when an unelected uh, friend of the Prime Minister had so much influence of, about, over British policy towards the Middle East. In this sense, I think that Michael Levy probably did do some damage to our British interests, but very clearly he damaged 
Britain's reputation in the Middle East. But Labour may lose the general election next spring. Today, the Conservative Friends of Israel are making sure they will be influential if David Cameron forms the next government. I've just come from the Conservative Party Conference Centre and it's filled with every kind of lobbyist and interest group promoting their message. It's impossible not to admire the sheer professionalism and hard work of the Conservative Friends of Israel with their long list of breakfast, lunches and evening receptions. They expect the Conservative Party to hear their message and more than that, to deliver. The longer I'm here, the more I'm beginning to feel that the CFI's purpose is to make sure David Cameron's Middle East policy is in step with the political agenda of the current Israeli government. It also has a surprising friend. It seems that any friend of Israel is a friend of the CFI, even if they have a questionable past. I'm very interested that this man here, Mikhail Kaminsky, Polish political leader, this man has been lionized by the conservative friends of Israel because he's pro-Israeli. And they seem prepared to disregard the fact that in the past he's made remarks which to some people could be construed as anti-Semitic. Mr. Kaminsky represents a right-wing Polish party. A few years ago he refused to apologize to the Jews for what had happened to them in Poland during the Second World War. But today, the CFI is prepared to overlook those remarks, citing his support for Israel now. And David Cameron has put the Conservative Party into an alliance under Kaminsky's leadership in the European Parliament. Yet when Kaminsky spoke at the CFI luncheon, Director Stuart Pollock didn't want television in. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you take, please take it down. We asked Richard Harrington, the CFI's chairman, about Mr Kaminsky. CFI is totally supportive of Mr Kaminsky. About the CFI's activities and donations, he said, We work openly and publicly to ensure that Israel's case is properly understood in Parliament. There is a clear distinction to be made between donations made independently by individuals who happen to be members of CFI and those made by CFI as an organization. All donations have been registered in the appropriate way and are in the public domain. Even taking this into account, Dispatch's claims that donations add up to well over £10 million in the last eight years is not supported by any facts. In part two, Madonna's friend, the man who bankrolls the public face of Britain's pro-Israel lobby. January this year. Israel invaded Gaza in response to Hamas rocket attacks. TVs around the world broadcast pictures of destroyed homes and dead and wounded Palestinian civilians. Months later, allegations of human rights violations were still in the news. But you wouldn't know it from this piece in the News of the World or from this piece on the Mirror's website. Both about the threat Israel faces from its neighbors. And you certainly wouldn't know that both journalists' trips had been organized and paid for by an organization called BICOM, the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Center. BICOM is one of the most well-funded pro-Israel lobby groups in Britain. One man who knows BICOM is Professor David Newman. A few years ago, he worked alongside BICOM to help get across Israel's message in British universities. They tend to be very blindly supportive. Um, in, in other words, there is clearly a debate. It's not just a debate here. It's a huge debate inside Israel, whether Israel should or should not continue to control the West Bank, whether settlements are legal or illegal, moral or immoral. 
And what you often find is that the groups such as BICOM outside Israel tend to close down that sort of debate. They tend to say you have to be totally supportive of Israel, full stop, whatever Israel does. BICOM's chairman is Pochu Zabludovics, who contributed to David Cameron's campaign funds. The Sunday Times ranks him as the 18th richest man in Britain. Yet outside his circle, few people seem to know much about him. I've never met the guy. What is interesting is that he wasn't part of the traditional Anglo-Jewish establishment, but there is something in England which has been founded in the past 10 years called the Jewish Leadership Council, which is sort of a house of lords of the big Jewish givers or donors. And then my understanding is, after he sort of funded BICOM, he was then co-opted onto the Jewish Leadership Council. So I asked David Goldberg, Rabbi Emeritus of London's largest liberal synagogue. Not a name I know. It's not come across my consciousness mm -hmm. in my dealings in Anglo Jewry. In fact, Mr. Zabludovics holds Finnish citizenship. Today he has a home here in North London's exclusive Bishop's Avenue, worth at least three million. His father made a fortune selling Israeli artillery and mortars around the world. Pohu also used to be in the arms business, then moved into property, buying four hotel casinos in Las Vegas. His Tamares group, which is registered in Liechtenstein, has business interests worldwide. Recently, the Zabludovixes were guests at Madonna's 51st birthday party in the Italian town of Portofino. More interestingly, Mr. Zabludovics, as well as chairman, is also bankrolling BICOM. Here are its latest report and accounts. These show that last year it received no less than £800,000, a huge donation, from Poko Zabludovic. The accounts also contain a very interesting clause. The company meets its day-to-day -day working capital requirements through the support of P. Zabludovic. P. Zabludovic provides monthly financial support to the company by way of donations. He has pledged his ongoing support of the company for the 12 months from the balance sheet date. He has also pledged further support as the company may require. Mr. Zabludovic has given a further 1.3 million over the previous two years. Dispatches has also discovered that Mr. Zabludovic has a business interest in the Middle East that raises questions about his and BICOM's approach to a peace settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. We're travelling along the highway from Israel to the occupied West Bank. On the other side of the security wall are Palestinian villages. We're on our way to Mali Adumim, an Israeli settlement where we have discovered that the biggest building, this shopping mall, belongs to a company partly owned by Mr. Zabludovics. Mali Adumim is regarded by Israelis as being part of Israel, but counts as an illegal settlement under international law. It's settlements such as these which, in the eyes of many, pose a massive obstacle to peace in the Middle East. The big question is this, does it matter that a big business tycoon like Mr. Zabludovics, with such a vested interest in one of these settlements, is also a major donor to the pro-Israeli lobby in Britain? Any settlement of Israelis built within the West Bank, which is defined as occupied territory, in international terminology is illegal. Isn't it quite important that a figure who has such a major vested interest in the settlements is also the major funder of BICOM? That would tend to indicate in what direction the message of BICOM is going. It's going to be more supportive of settlements or less critical of settlements than if someone from the left was investing their money into BICOM. Does it disturb you that somebody who's publicly promoting the interests of Israel here in Britain has business interests in the West Bank. I would guess that anybody who invests money there 
has taken a calculated decision that this will not be going back under even the most favorable of peace treaties. So they've made a business judgment which will be no doubt vindicated by profits. We asked to interview Mr. Zabludovic, but he declined. Instead, he wrote to us agreeing that he was a minority shareholder in the company that owns the Mali Adumim Mao. He said, In terms of my position on the issue of settlements, I remain a major proponent for the creation of a Palestinian state. I understand that Israel will need to make concessions for this to be achieved. I did, though, get to talk to BICOM's chief executive, Lorna Fitzsimons. We're a very, we're a very open organisation, and you couldn't get away with working the, with the level of journalists that we work with across the whole spectrum if we weren't absolutely o open. If you're being transparent with people, we should know who your donors are. If our donors were able to influence our operational policy, then maybe you might have a point. But one of the things that we were absolutely and utterly um, set up to be is avowedly independent, um, that nobody influences our policy. So I asked about Mr. Zabludovic's influence within BICOM. Our chairman, Puyu, um, is no different than anybody else. He's one amongst, you know, 120 individuals that support us. I asked if it disturbed her that BICOM's chairman has a commercial interest in a settlement which is viewed as illegal under international law. I don't know about any of his business interests whatsoever. It's never been discussed with us. The board never discussed their various independent individual business interests. We are solely here to provide journalists and interested policy makers and opinion formers with the ability to scrutinise more closely the various different strands in the debate that is Israel. There are, of course, other groups lobbying on behalf of Israel in Britain, in addition to BICOM and the Conservative and Labour Friends of Israel. There's the Jewish Leadership Council, the Zionist Federation, and the Board of Deputies of British Jews. Aside from seeking to influence politicians and opinion formers, which is the stock and trade of any lobby, some members of the pro-Israel lobby are also especially aggressive towards British television and the press. I have spoken to editors who, who just say, actually, it's just not worth the trouble. I, I stay away from the, I, I stay away from the, the subject, or I stay away from staring it up. The BBC and the Guardian are portrayed as being the biggest media enemies of Israel that exist, maybe in Europe, but certainly in the UK. And the lobby keeps them under constant attack. Well, it, it's off the scale in, in terms of Israel. I mean, I see other ambassadors, but I can't. I'm, I'm trying to, to see if I can remember ever being um, carpeted or taken to task seriously over, over our coverage of countries. And I, I'm, offhand, I can't think of one. It's an evening in February 2006. At the Israeli ambassador's residence in London, a special meeting is taking place. Present are the Israeli ambassador, Pohu Zabludovic, Henry Grunwald, who was president of the British Board of Deputies, and property magnate Gerald Ronson. They're unhappy with a two-part article by The Guardian's Middle East correspondent, Chris McGreal, who has compared Israeli occupation of the West Bank with apartheid in South Africa. They decide that Henry Grunwald and Gerald Ronson will pay Rusbridger a visit. Their pitch was that The Guardian was in, in, encouraging anti-Semitism to the extent that it was effectively an incitement to, to violence uh, against Jews in, in Britain. Henry Grunwald's a very bright barrister and made the case in a perfectly straightforward way. And then Ronson, who was the kind of sort of heavy on the occasion, began by saying, I think his, his phrase was, uh, I've always said, opinions are like arseholes, everyone's got one. Um, and then he effectively said, I'm in favor of free speech, but there is a line which can't be crossed. And as far as I'm concerned, you've crossed it. And um, I, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, you must stop this. 
Les Ronson mm -hmm. telling you you've been fomenting attacks on Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to him? I just said, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in the evidence. I'm, I'm not sure how you make that causal connection between somebody reading an article that's critical of the, uh, of the foreign policy of Israel and then thinking, uh, why don't I go out and, and um, mug Jews on the, on the streets of London? I mean, I'm, I just can't believe that happens. On top of the visit to the Guardian's offices, a lengthy complaint against McGreal's articles was made to the Press Complaints Commission by an American pro-Israel media watchdog called Camera, with a reputation for aggressively complaining against what it claims is anti-Israel reporting. In the end, the Press Complaints Commission found only one small fact to be wrong. Nobody could shake the facts on it but it was nevertheless regarded as, a, as something that just should not have been published. The views of those who criticise The Guardian are not shared by the entire British Jewish community. In the occupied territories, Israel is an apartheid state. There's no two ways about it. When settlers travel on one road and Palestinians have to use another road, when settlers are governed by Israeli law, and Palestinians are governed by military law, you are talking about apartheid. What sort of reaction are you expecting uh, when the pro-Israeli lobby notes your conversation in this film? Oh, they'll say, oh, there goes Goldberg, the anti-Zionist self-hating Jew again. You know, I'm quite sure. <laughs> in fact, we found that by no means all Britain's 300,000 Jews are happy for the pro-Israel lobby groups to represent their views. Yeah, Tony uh, Lehrman used to be director of the London-based yes, Institute yeah. for Jewish Policy Research. Yeah, I mean, Today, he's a regular Guardian contributor. Some of these bodies like to present themselves as representing all of Jewish opinion um, and don't account or don't take into account the diversity of opinion um, in, in this country. Um, and, I mean, that's one of the... Th one of the criticisms that people um, from within the Jewish community who are critics of Israel level at the Israel lobby that there is this tendency to make it look as if all Jews feel one way about Israel when in fact there's a lot of different opinion about Israel. There is a split in the Jewish community about Israel. The leaders tend to be blindly pro-Israeli. The Israel lobby does represent a narrow right-wing agenda, but it's, it is not representative of the entire Jewish community. Nonetheless, we found that calling critics of Israel's foreign policy anti-Semitic has become a deliberate tactic among some of Israel's more strident lobby groups. Here's an example from a blog based in New York, its sole purpose is to scrutinise The Guardian's Comment is Free website. Hawkeye, the mystery man who says he runs it, told the Jewish Chronicle, Besides the fact that CIF features a long list of anti-Zionists, including many Jewish anti-Zionists, it, its comment threads are full of vile anti-Semitic sentiments. How do you react to that? I think it would be a terribly dangerous thing if, if the British press were made to feel that, that they couldn't criticise Israel because they're going to be held up as anti semitic I think it's a, it's a very disreputable argument. I've been having a look through the Comment is Free Watch website. Here's what it's got to say about an article by Tony Lerman. It says that Lerman is making despicable, libelous and completely unsubstantiated allegations about Jews. It says that's anti-Semitic and he's a nasty anti-Semite. I asked Tony Lerman what he feels about Hawkeye's comments. It's upsetting, but uh, one gets over it. I think there are people who are deliberately manipulating the use of the term anti-Semitism because uh, they do see that it's useful in defending Israel. It might well be that some critics of Israel are seriously anti-Semitic. OK, deal with them on the case. 
others are voicing a genuine feeling which should be respected and does not make them anti-Semitic. I've been accused in certain newspapers because I've been talking to Hamas and Hezbollah of being anti-Semitic, and I just take that with a pinch of salt. In part three, Dispatches Investigates, has the BBC been compromised by the pro-Israel lobby? Dispatches has been investigating how Britain's pro-Israel lobby exercises its influence and financial muscle today in Westminster and how critics of Israel's foreign policy in the press get branded as anti-Semitic. But what about the BBC? On the record, BBC executives tell us they've always reported Israel and Palestine without bias. Off the record, former executives and programme makers have told us they've always been aware of pressure from top management over Middle East coverage. Charlie Beckett was a BBC news editor and worked for Channel 4. He now heads a media think tank at the London School of Economics and keeps in touch with his former colleagues. There is a very strong and very active um, Israeli uh, lobby exercise, both an official uh, Israeli lobby and, of course, there is a sizable population who are very sympathetic to Israel and are very active at making their, their voice heard and putting direct pressure, especially on the BBC. It works because the BBC has no choice, in a sense, but to respond. The Israeli government and another pro-Israel internet watchdog, this one called Honest Reporting, take full advantage of that. Honest reporting has been in the forefront of efforts to fight the media's institutional bias against Israel. March 2003. As American and British-led coalition forces invade Iraq, the BBC broadcasts a hard-hitting investigation into Israel's nuclear weapons program. The Israeli government press office compares the film to the worst of Nazi propaganda. The Israeli government immediately imposes restrictions on BBC crews in Israel. When Israel's Prime Minister Ariel Sharon visits Downing Street, the BBC alone is banned from his press conference. And Honest Reporting UK says the film is part of a campaign to vilify Israel. It says the inference behind the film is that Israel would have been a more appropriate target than Iraq for the coalition forces to attack. March 2004. Israeli minister Nathan Sharansky complains to the BBC that its reporter Orla Gerin is anti-Semitic and that she shows total identification with the goals and methods of Palestinian terror groups. When she reports from Lebanon, Honest Reporting UK is there. Honest Reporting claims to have 175,000 subscribers. Thousands of them, many from the United States, bombard the BBC with emails alleging anti-Israel bias. BBC staff have told us. This April, the BBC Trust censured Middle East correspondent Jeremy Bowen for comments he made on the BBC website about the history of the conflict. We can reveal that a week earlier, the Jewish Chronicle published a piece by Bowen which included exactly the same phrases. You can still read them on the Jewish Chronicle website. But Camera, the American-based media watchdog which earlier had complained about The Guardian, this time formally complained to the BBC. Then a London lawyer complained. The BBC was forced to investigate. The BBC investigated Jeremy Bowen um, because they were under such extraordinary pressure. The way that that investigation was perceived by Bowen's colleagues, if you like, in the BBC, was that this was management hoping with one bound to be free 
from what was very, very intensive pressure, but it struck a chill through the actual BBC newsroom because it signalled to them that they were under assault. Do you think the BBC would have carried out that investigation into Boeing but for this Israeli pressure which you've been talking about? No, of course they wouldn't have done. Veteran BBC presenter Jonathan Dimbleby thought the BBC had caved in. Not only has Boeing's hard-won reputation been sullied, but the BBC's international status as the best source of trustworthy news in the world has been gratuitously undermined. When we approached Dimbleby, he refused to take part in this programme. We can reveal that he too is now under investigation for making the above comments. The BBC Trust sent a representative to Oxford to question Professor Schleim about the accuracy of Jeremy Bowen's piece. I couldn't fault him. I didn't see where he had, been, had gone wrong. And my conclusions from this affair is that there are some people uh, in the Jewish community in Britain who uh, listen to the news, monitor the news, and are too quick to start protesting to the BBC. Their complaints are usually unjustified. It was time to find out who Honest Reporting UK is, who funds it and who it represents. First surprise, its office is not in Britain, but here in Jerusalem. Its managing editor, Simon Plosker, who is British, admits he worked for Bicom in London and also for the Israel Army Press Office. Hi, is this Honest Reporting? Yes, it is. Uh, Peter Oberon from Channel 4 Television. Simon Plosker wasn't around, and the people there didn't want to speak on his behalf. Um, you can ask me. I've just had a conversation with the bloke inside that office. I said, is this the office of Honest Reporting? He said, well, difficult that. Uh, we work for a project of Honest Reporting, but as for Honest Reporting itself, it's kind of a virtual organisation. I still wanted to talk to Simon Plosker about why he ceaselessly attacks the BBC and who he works for. He declined to be interviewed, but gave us this statement. We don't target the UK media. It is simply that the demonisation of Israel in the media here is that much worse than it is in other places, such as the USA. The BBC and The Guardian produce examples of anti-Israel bias on a more regular basis than others. The BBC isn't just a programme maker. It has another role as lead broadcaster of emergency appeals to raise funds for our disaster relief agencies to provide humanitarian aid in world catastrophes. It's done so for the last 40 years in conflicts around the world. Last winter, when Israeli forces invaded Gaza, over 1,000 Palestinians were killed, many of them civilians. Hundreds of homes were destroyed, along with much of Gaza's economy and infrastructure. The Disasters Emergency Committee asked British television networks to broadcast an appeal. But Mark Thompson, the BBC's Director General, refused. Labour Minister for Media, former BBC journalist Ben Bradshaw, was outraged. This was an inexplicable decision. I'm afraid the BBC has to stand up to the Israeli authorities occasionally. Israel has a long reputation of bullying uh, the BBC. And... We decided in the end it was such a matter of public controversy, it was so much heading our news bulletins day after day at the moment, that to broadcast an appeal like this, however worthy the cause, would just mean that it would pull, cause into put into question, uh, call into question uh, audiences' trust in our impartiality. The BBC also said that Thompson had taken advice from the BBC's Independent Appeals Advisory Committee before making his decision. Niaz Alam was a member of that committee. He resigned over Thompson's decision. What was said exaggerates the truth of whatever consultation took place. The committee didn't formally meet and wasn't consulted in the sense of the committee being consulted. What about the argument that the appeal would call into question the BBC's impartiality? This appeal, it did go out on Channel 4 and on ITV 
and nobody's questioning their impartiality. It was just a bog standard disasters emergency appeal. The children of Gaza are suffering. Today, this is not about the rights and wrongs of the conflict. These people simply need your help. The Disasters Emergency Committee refuses to talk in public. So we asked the members of the DEC whether they would talk only about humanitarian need in Gaza and how they assessed it. But Christian Aid, the Catholic agency, Cathod, Save the Children and Oxfam all said it was just too sensitive. Do you think the Israeli lobby was responsible for the decision not to have the Gaza appeal? Turn it around, it wouldn't have been a serious concern for them if they didn't have that pressure from an extraordinarily active, sophisticated and persuasive lobby sticking up for uh, the Israeli viewpoint. We have also discovered that the BBC's Gaza decision is exceptional in the light of past appeals. It's far less controversial than it perhaps um, an appeal in 1982 for victims of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And yet the BBC had no trouble doing an appeal in those days. In 1982, Israel's invasion of Lebanon led to thousands of civilian deaths and ended with the horrendous slaughter of Palestinian men, women and children in Sabra and Shatila refugee camps by Lebanese Christian militia who were Israel's allies at the time. Here's Sue Lawley as the face of the BBC in that appeal. The situation looks beyond help, but we can help. We can help by supporting the work of the relief agencies who are now fighting a desperate battle in the towns and villages of the Lebanon. So please send whatever you can to the Lebanon Appeal, P.O. Box 999. Looking at that appeal from 25 years ago, Mark Thompson's decision not to run an appeal for Gaza looks inconsistent. It looks to me as if the BBC has come dangerously close to losing its reputation for impartiality and for helping those in need around the world, whoever they are. What's unique about the pro-Israeli lobbies is that they have such good access to politicians. They often operate behind the scenes and they have primary regard, even though they may come from Britain, not to the interests of the British people, but to a mixture of what they see as British interests, but the interests of another country. In making this programme, we haven't found anything even faintly resembling a conspiracy, but we have found a worrying lack of transparency, and the influence of the pro-Israel lobby continues to be felt. Well, Channel 4's 3D week begins next. More details in a sec. You'll need your 3D specs. If you don't have the specs, you can still view and enjoy the programmes.